All right, well, welcome to Vital Voices. Uh, we're really excited about our presentation tonight. I'm just gonna briefly tell you a little bit about our college if you're not familiar. We are at the University of Houston downtown, which is the second largest university in Houston and the most diverse university in Texas and the Southern region. The College of Public Service focuses on community engagement and training people to serve Houston and beyond. We have award-winning programs in social work, in education and in criminal justice, uh, and really are thoughtful about how we want to interact with our community and try to better our community. And I think this presentation is a great example of that as we think of the challenges going on in the world now, I think focusing and learning about trauma and grief are very important. So thank you for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful center director, Mr. Villano. Thank you, Dean Schwartz. Um... So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we have the great privilege of having uh, Dr. Julie Kaplow with us this evening. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Kaplow a couple years ago when uh, we were working on a project for a, a, an organization called Generation One. And I was just so impressed at uh, how Dr. Kaplow just uh, gave her expertise so freely and so willingly and was just so, just was, I, I was just blown away by her willingness to engage with an organization that really, you know, they couldn't afford the help. They needed the experts and uh, she was there ready and willing to put everything, all the resources that she had behind helping this organization that works with inner city uh, kindergarten children. Um, so I was just really impressed by that. And we've, we've uh, had a, a working relationship ever since then. And she's, I just know her to be a wonderful, caring person. Uh, she'd have to be to do the kind of work that she does. Let me tell you a, a little bit about Dr. Kaplow. She is a licensed clinical psychologist, board certified in clinical child and adolescent psychology. She serves as the executive director of the Trauma and Grief Centers at the Hackett Center for Mental Health in Houston and the Children's Hospital in New Orleans. She's also the professor of psychiatry at the Tulane School of Medicine, and she serves as the CEO of the Lucerne Center for Trauma and Grief, which is a group practice providing free teletherapy services to youth and families exposed to trauma and loss throughout Texas and Louisiana. And Dr. Kaplow, prior to um, her work with the Hackett Center, uh, Dr. Kaplow uh, was the, she um, was the chief exec, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking at my, uh, my my other document here. Hold on one second. She was uh, the chief of psychology and the vice chair for behavioral health in the Department of Pediatrics at Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine. Um, following Hurricane Harvey, Dr. Kaplow and her team provided evidence-based risk screening and interventions to children and families adversely affected by Hurricane Harvey and its aftermath. She also helped to establish the Santa Fe Res uh, Resiliency Center following the Santa Fe High School shooting, where her clinicians provided evidence-based assessment and treatment to families that were impacted by the shooting. She's a strong, strong proponent of a scientist practitioner approach. Her, her primary research interests focus on the behavioral and psychological consequences of childhood trauma and bereavement with an emphasis on therapeutically modifiable factors that can be used to inform interventions. She oversees the development and evaluation of novel treatments for traumatized and bereaved youth and disseminates trauma and brief informed best practices to communities around the country. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to my friend, Dr. Julie Kaplow. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that very kind um, introduction. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and we'll get started. OK, so I know that many of you, all of you have heard of long COVID, right? So the physical symptoms that can linger after having acquired the virus. But I think what has not been talked about 
frequently enough is psychological long COVID. So we know that so many children across the country are grieving the deaths of loved ones. In fact, we know that about 180,000 kids have lost either a caregiver or a parent. And so what I wanna talk about tonight is this silent epidemic of childhood trauma and grief that we, I, I feel very passionately about um, that we need to become more aware of. And I think educators are in the perfect position to be able to identify kids who are experiencing trauma and grief and get them the help that they need as quickly as possible. So I really appreciate all of you attending tonight. I know it's 6.30 on a Tuesday evening, so I really appreciate it. So first what we're gonna do is talk about what we do at the Trauma and Grief Center here in Houston. We also have a Trauma and Grief Center that we just stood up in New Orleans as well. So we'll talk about what we do at both of those centers. I'm going to provide some key definitions related to trauma and grief. I'm gonna tell you about a theory of grief called multidimensional grief theory that really explains how grief can manifest in children of different ages. We're also gonna talk about links between bereavement and suicide risk and distinguishing between PTSD and grief and why this is a distinction that is very important. I'm also gonna to touch on one of the evidence-based treatments that we've been using and disseminating for addressing trauma and grief in youth. And then I have some tips for educators and caregivers about how to best support children who are grieving. And then finally, I'm gonna end with just a little bit of information about what we call the cost of caring. And that's really paying attention to the secondary traumatic stress that so many of us are experiencing when we're around children who are themselves experiencing trauma and grief. Okay, so the Trauma and Grief Center has four different pillars. The first is that we develop, implement, and disseminate evidence-based assessments and interventions for kids ages seven, kids and young adults, ages seven to 21, who've experienced any form of trauma or the death of a loved one. We also conduct research on both adaptive and maladaptive responses to childhood trauma and loss, as well as treatment effectiveness. So we're constantly measuring the treatments that we're using to ensure that they're working and modifying those treatments to make sure that they're adapted for the different populations that we're serving. We also provide training and professional education in trauma and bereavement related topics including interventions that we ourselves are using because the idea is that we really want to empower our community to be able to provide the very same treatments that we provide. And then finally, translate trauma and bereavement informed best practices into policy. So how do we ensure that every child who has experienced any form of trauma or loss receives the best practice care that they need where they are? And that includes in the schools, in pediatric offices, however we can reach them. So I know I might be preaching to the choir here, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, when we're talking about trauma, what we're really talking about is the experience of either a real or perceived threat to life or bodily integrity, or the life or bodily integrity of a loved one that causes an overwhelming sense of terror, horror, helplessness, or fear. The key word here is perceived threat. So what might feel traumatic to one child may not be traumatic to another. So we really have to go with the subjective experience of that child. And there are different types of traumas. So we know that there are acute traumas that often really happen once in a lifetime, hopefully. For us, hurricanes, not so much, but generally um, a car accident or a school shooting. But chronic traumas are those that go on for long periods of time. This includes domestic violence, child abuse, neglect, community violence, and even poverty. And what we know is that in our underserved communities, acute traumas and chronic traumas co-occur. So they're happening all at the same time. And in fact, we know that about half of US children will experience at least one trauma over the course of their lifetime. So we know that this is a very significant public health issue. We also know that identifying traumatic stress in children can be really challenging. And the reason for that is because traumatic stress can resemble anxiety. Often kids who have PTSD are worried that something bad is gonna to happen to someone else in their family or to themselves. 
Traumatic stress can also resemble ADHD. So we hear this all the time from teachers that kids who've experienced trauma might look hyperactive when they're actually hypervigilant, meaning they're on edge and jumpy, and that's symptoms of PTSD. Or they might look like they're inattentive when they're trying so hard to avoid thinking about or talking about the event that happened. And so I would say that about 95% of the kids that are referred to us with PT for ADHD actually have PTSD. And so this is something we're really trying to educate others about. Conduct problems. So again, we hear this often from teachers where um, children will be out of their seat, running around, um, really dysregulated, and it seems to come out of the blue. But what we know is that oftentimes when children are triggered in the classroom, when they're reminded of the bad thing that happened, they are out of their seats and totally dysregulated. And often teachers don't know why. And so it can look like they have conduct problems or oppositional defiant disorder. And then finally, physical illness. We hear this from pediat <clears throat> pediatricians all the time, where a child may be presenting with constant stomach aches or constant headaches. And what we know is that for children who are very avoidant, who don't want to talk about what happened, often those PTSD symptoms can manifest physically in somatic complaints. So if pediatricians are not asking the right questions, they may never recognize that this is actually post-traumatic stress. I do want to share with you a couple of quotes from teachers that we interviewed following Hurricane Maria. And I think this really exemplifies how children's behaviors when they're traumatized can get misunderstood. So one kindergarten teacher says, our kids were already acting out before the hurricane, but things got much worse afterwards. Sometimes the whole class feels out of control. And then another teacher says, so many of the children seem to have ADHD, they just can't keep still and, and listen for more than a minute. So again, the perception is that the kids are out of control, they have ADHD, they might even be perceived as oppositional. But again, what we know is that this is often what PTSD looks like, especially in young children. So I wanna share with you an experiment and you'll have to humor me because I don't normally like to compare children to rats, but I do think this is a really good example of what can happen when children are in a stressful environment and so this was a study done back in 1998 by Pinksep. And what he did is he studied rat play. And his hypothesis was that when rats were in a calm, continuous state where nothing was stressing them in their environment, they would be able to learn from their environment, absorb new information, and even experience what he called joy. What he also hypothesized is that when rats were stressed, when they were in an environment that was toxic or scary, that they would not be able to absorb and learn and they would not experience joy. And so what he did is he looked at the play of rats, lab rats in a cage. And so these were lab rats. Again, they had not been outside of the cage. And you can see here that over the course of four days, they were playing you know, and, and frolicking and running around in the cage. And then on day four, he inserted a single cat hair into the cage, remember, They've never seen a cat. But once that cat hair was introduced, the rats not only stopped playing, but they froze. So they literally were not moving. And then on day five, what's really interesting is that he removed the cat hair, but the rats never returned to baseline. They never played, um, and he followed them for over a month. Now, what does this mean for our kids? What this means for us as, as mammals is that we are wired to respond to danger and threats to safety. So for example, if a child is living with the cat or a perpetrator and the perpetrator is removed or the child is re removed from the home, we can't expect them to just snap back and learn and absorb from their environment and experience joy. What we have to do is create that sense of safety and security over time so that they can get back to a place where that's possible. So just recognizing that is a critically important piece of creating a more trauma-informed classroom environment. So the key question becomes, the million dollar question, is not what's wrong with that child, but what happened to that child. So recognizing the impact of the environment on children's behavior. We also know that there can be very significant long-term consequences if trauma does not get addressed right away. 
So we know that over time, if children experience chronic traumas, they actually have smaller brain volumes, more risk for depression and suicide, school problems, problems with peers, substance abuse, violent behavior, delinquent behavior, and even the intergenerational transmission of trauma or traumatic stress. So this can go on for generations. And so again, this speaks to the need to intervene early, especially because our society's most significant problems stem from unresolved childhood traumas. Um, so again, if we can intervene early and address these things early on, we can actually prevent some of the most significant problems that we're dealing with right now. So I wanna to move to a very specific form of trauma, which is bereavement. So bereavement is the experience of deprivation or loss by death. And grief is the psychological or behavioral response that arises from bereavement. So in other words, bereavement is to trauma as grief is to PTSD. And the reason this is important is because there are many studies that look at the impact of bereavement on children over time. There are very few studies that look at how children are actually dealing with that bereavement. So they don't look at grief. And this is an area that we're actively trying to explore because it's so critically important. So why focus on bereavement as a particular form of trauma? We know that it's actually the most frequently reported type of trauma in clinic referred youth. It's also the most common form of trauma worldwide. It's the most distressing form of trauma among adults and youth in the general population. So if you were to ask anybody, what is the hardest thing that's ever happened to you? The vast majority would say it was the death of my mother, my brother, my sister. It's also the strongest predictor of poor school outcomes of, above and beyond any other form of trauma. So this was a study conducted by my former postdoc, Ben Osterhoff, who looked at about 10,000 students across the country and found that the sudden death of a loved one was actually the strongest predictor of poor school grades, school dropout, school failure, um, lack of school connectedness, above and beyond sexual abuse, physical abuse, witnessing domestic violence. So this is something that we're really trying to raise awareness about, especially in the school setting, given that often bereavement is sort of overlooked as the kind of issue that could actually create these long-term school problems. And this is particularly relevant for youth of color. So what we find in our data and in national data is that youth of color tend to have higher rates of both PTSD and maladaptive gr grief because of the fact that they're experiencing higher rates of COVID-19 related deaths as well as violent death. So we wanna obviously be very attuned to the fact that this is a population that really needs our attention. I also want to talk for a minute about bereavement among justice involved youth, another very important population. So most detained youth report the death of a close loved one with most <clears throat> experiencing at least two or more significant, with over 70% experiencing at least two or more significant losses. Detained youth report experiencing their first death on average by the age of five. Deaths are most frequently characterized by violent losses in this population. And more than half of detained youth report the death of a primary caregiver, although only a minority of these primary caregivers are parents. So again, this speaks to the importance of really recognizing how families are, are constructed. Um, and in this population in particular, that there may be lots of losses that are critical for this group um, that, that go beyond that primary caregiver, um, the, the parenting role. So children's grief reactions, not simply bereavement, play an important role in future psychological functioning. So this is a really important take home message that we can't just say that death of a loved one leads to poor outcomes. We need to really be looking at grief reactions and how that child is handling the bereavement to be able to, to make more of a, a more accurate prediction. So there are some facts that I just wanna lay out about grief that I think are pretty important. The first is that most bereaved children will go on to lead healthy, happy, productive lives. That's just a fact. So we don't wanna pathologize normal grieving. We know that many kids will lose a loved one over the course of their lives and they will be okay. There is no right or wrong way to grieve. So often you hear about, you know, well, after a year they should be fine, or you know, society kind of gives us these 
um, sort of prescriptions about how you should be grieving. And we know that people grieve in very different ways and that all of those ways of grieving are okay. There is no set timeline for grief. So, um, you know, the bottom line is that grief is not a problem to be fixed. It is a natural part of, um, of life and a reflection of the love that we had for the person who died. So it's not as if grief stops. It changes, certainly, over time. But because you loved that person, that grief will remain. Now, that's not to say that some people can't get very stuck in their grief, and including children. So that's really what we're going to sort of hone in on now is how do we know? How do we know what is normal, healthy grieving versus more maladaptive grieving? So this is multidimensional grief theory. I've had the privilege of working with some colleagues at UCLA on this theory, Chris Lane and Bob Pinus. And what we have found, both empirically and also through our clinical work, is that grief in childhood is multidimensional, meaning that sometimes you'll hear in the adult literature about someone having or not having prolonged grief disorder, or having or not having complicated grief. But with kids, what we find is that grief can manifest in three primary ways. We know that there can be separation distress. This is yearning and longing for the person who died. There can be existential or identity distress. This is feeling lost without the person, or how am I going to get through life without the person? Or there's circumstance-related distress, which is exactly what it sounds like, being very preoccupied with, with the way the person died. So I wish I could have intervened, or I wish they didn't have to suffer so much. But we also know that for each of these dimensions, there's an adaptive counterpart. So for example, I was treating a young girl whose mom died um, of cancer, and she and her mom were extremely close and so she was devastated at this loss and when we worked together what we started to realize is that the more she engaged in behaviors that she used to do with her mom like making her mom's favorite apple pie or taking swim lessons because that was something they really enjoyed doing together the more she felt connected to her mom in a different way but a healthy way so we would say that would be the adaptive side of separation distress with existential or identity distress, we hear all the time, I don't know how I'm gonna get through life without my dad, for example. But we also hear things like, I wanna do things that would have made my dad proud of me, or I wanna live the kind of life that he would have wanted for me. That would be the adaptive side of existential or identity distress. And with circumstance-related distress, believe it or not, we see this all the time in children, even as young as, as age eight. So there was a young boy that I was working with whose father died in a tragic plane crash. And when I asked him, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, I want to be an engineer so I can make planes that don't break anymore. Um, we hear things like this all the time. And in fact, some of society's most important in inventions and interventions come from tragic losses. So things like seat belts, mothers against drunk driving, exit doors. Um, you know, fire alarms, all of these things stem from having lost someone. Um, and so what we want to do in the interventions that we use is really harness that more adaptive side and make meaning of the loss and help kids to transform those circumstances into something that can help other people. So these are some examples taken from trauma and grief component therapy. Um, these are illustrations that are in this treatment manual, and I'm going to talk more about this therapy in just a few minutes. But this is an example of separation distress. So this boy's father died, and his mom is saying, your dad would want you to enjoy these tickets. Why don't we go to the game together? And he's thinking, I can't ever go back there anymore. It won't ever be the same without him. So we see this all the time where kids start to shy away from the activities that they once enjoyed because doing those things without their person there is just too painful for them. This is an example of existential or identity distress, and this is a girl whose father died, and he was her biggest cheerleader. And she just got accepted to her college of choice. She's thinking, I don't care about my future anymore if he's not going to be a part of it. He'll never see me graduate anyway, so what's the point? So we often see this in adolescents who are grieving, where they will give up on their hopes and dreams and aspirations for the future if the idea of pursuing those is too painful without their cheerleader there, without the person who is supporting them. And then finally, this is an example of circumstance-related distress. This is a girl whose brother died in a gang fight. 
Every time I see his picture, I can't help thinking about the night he got killed. It gets me so mad that it's hard to remember the good times. So she may want to positively reminisce about her brother, but every time she thinks about him and the way he died, she is flooded with those very upsetting thoughts and images and feelings related to how he was killed. And so it's very hard to hold on to those positive memories. So why are we using this multidimensional framework? We believe that this is an important framework because different dimensions of grief may be more prominent at certain developmental stages. So what we're seeing in our research is that separation distress tends to be more prominent in young children, whereas existential or identity distress tends to be more prominent in adolescents, which makes sense if you kind of think about the developmental tasks of each of those age groups. Different dimensions of grief may not be present in all bereaved populations. So we know that in environments where there are high levels of community violence, we tend to see higher levels of circumstance-related distress compared to other areas where the violence is not so high. And finally, what we know now is that different dimensions of grief may require different treatment components. So in other words, the way we go about addressing and supporting kids who've experienced, who are experiencing separation distress, for example, looks very different than how we would support them if they're experiencing circumstance-related distress. So the take-home message here is that one-size-fits-all treatments for grief are not very effective. Um, and we know that now because if we can hone in on the specific dimensions that a child is experiencing, that's where we really start to see improvements. So I wanna take a minute to just talk about this link between bereavement and suicide risk. So we know that suicide was already a public health concern even before the pandemic. And it was, you know, back in 2016, it was the second leading cause of death among adolescents. 18% of high school students report seriously considering suicide, and 9% report an actual suicide attempt in the last year. And we know that these have increased at least slightly since the pandemic. We also know that adverse life events are linked to suicide risk, including physical abuse, sexual abuse, family violence, discrimination, natural disasters, and of course, bereavement. And so this is what I wanna just hone in on right now is this link between bereavement and suicide risk, particularly in adolescents. So what we often find in adolescents who lose a loved one is that they may have some reunification fantasies, this idea that somehow if they die, they will be reunified. And obviously this depends on their own spiritual beliefs or religious beliefs, but this was um, an actual example of a girl that I treated and she and this is coming again from trauma and grief component therapy she's thinking it doesn't matter if i live or die if i crash the bad news is i'm dead but the good news is i get to see my friend again so this is a girl who lost her best friend and she's fantasizing about what could happen if she does die and this can come in a couple of different forms it can come in the form of risk-taking behavior so driving recklessly is an example or it can come in the form of just sort of passive I don't care if I live or die. Now, one of the things that's so important about this is that we don't wanna just assume that all kids who are having reunification fantasies are at high risk for actually dying by suicide. And in fact, we know that this is a normative kind of reaction, but we do obviously wanna monitor that if we're seeing that in one of the teenagers that we work with. We also know that um, there's the interpersonal psychological theory of suicide that I want to just also talk about briefly. So this interpersonal psychological theory of suicide um, was, was developed by Joyner. And the idea is that there, um, he, he basically says that there are two things that are required in order for someone to die by suicide. And the first is thwarted belongingness. This is a fancy way of saying loneliness or perceived lack of support. He also talks about perceived burdensomeness. So the idea that I'm a drain on the resources of others, you know, I, people would be better off without me. And the concerning thing is that we see this all the time in bereaved youth. And I just wanna give you some examples. These are direct quotes from children that we interviewed. So examples of thwarted belongingness, nobody understands me. No one knows what this is like. People think I'm weird because I don't have a mom anymore. Anyone I get close to dies, I shouldn't get close to anyone anymore. And then we also see perceived burdensomeness. 
Mom starts to cry every time I mention how much I miss dad, so the idea is she'd be better off without me here. If I had been better behaved in school, mom wouldn't have been so stressed and had a heart attack. So we see kids blaming themselves for the deaths of caregivers. And again, this idea, they would be better off without me. Others would be better off without me. So again, these are things that can increase risk for suicide. It doesn't mean that if they're present, they're absolutely going to try to kill themselves. But these are things that we need to be paying close attention to in bereaved youth. We also know that there are some bereavement-related risk factors that are specific to the context of the pandemic that we've recognized over the last two years. The first is that we see increases in thwarted belongingness as a result of social distancing. So this has been a real problem. Um, fortunately, obviously, we're, we're sort of back to being in groups again and back to being able to socialize to some degree. But for those kids who lost a loved one during that period of time, that was additionally painful, especially because they probably did not receive the needed support that they the, the support that they actually needed either at the funeral or in the weeks following because of social distancing. We also see increases in perceived burdensomeness as a result of ongoing pandemic related stressors. So for many parents um, who lost their spouse, you know, they not only had to find another job, but, you know, because of the pandemic, that may have been even more difficult for them. So children may be sort of carrying that additional burdensomeness in the context of the pandemic. And we also know that youth may be at higher risk for suicide as a result of the circumstances of the death. And I'm going to talk more about that actually in just a minute. So this is what I want to sort of move into at this point is thinking about how do we define traumatic bereavement? What are the circumstances of the death that would be considered a traumatic death? So what I'd like you to do is um, I'm going to be reading you excerpts from two case studies. These are, were actual youth that we treated through the Trauma and Grief Center. And I'd like you to just imagine if this child were sitting in front of you, what would they look like? What would they be presenting like? Um, sort of picture in your mind what that would look like for you. So this was um, a nine-year-old that we treated. Her, she is in a tragic car crash with her mother and father. Her mother is killed after suffering from numerous internal injuries. The child is not hurt, but she observes her mother's lifeless body from the back seat of the car. The second one was, um, this is a 12-year-old boy who experiences the anticipated death of his mother after suffering from breast cancer for three years. He served in a caretaking role during that time and had ample opportunity to say goodbye. So what I'd like to do now is present you with two quotes, one from each child. And I want you in the Q&A, if you're comfortable, to just tell me if you think this is the nine-year-old girl talking or the 12-year-old boy. So here's the first one. This child presents with extremely high levels of PTSD, minimal symptoms of maladaptive grief. During the interview, the child states, I just keep remembering it and I feel like I'm right back there again. I can't get it out of my mind. So how many of you think that this was the nine-year-old girl and how many think this was the 12-year-old boy? Okay, so one vote for nine-year-old girl, 12, nine, nine, 12, nine. Okay, it looks pretty mixed, but actually it looks like a few more of you think that it's the nine-year-old girl. Okay, so now <clears throat> what I'd like to do is move to the next one. I'm gonna close this for a minute. And, oops, I skipped over one. <laughs> okay. Um, this child presents with high levels of separation distress and existential distress, minimal symptoms of PTSD. During the interview states, my mom was like my best friend. I just want her back. I just want to see her again. So um, do you think this was the nine-year-old girl or 12-year-old boy? Okay, 12-year-old boy. Anyone else? 12-year-old boy, 12-year-old boy, nine-year-old, 12-year-old boy. Okay. So. Um, this was a little bit tricky, and I will explain why I use this example. So actually, the nine-year-old girl presents with extremely high levels of separation distress and existential distress, minimal symptoms of PTSD. 
During the interview, she states, my mom was my best friend. I just want her back. I just want to see her again. So I'll be honest with you, when we first saw this child, before she came in to the office, um, you know, we work in, so when we were um, seeing kids through our trauma and grief center, the way it was set up is that we would, I would be behind the mirror with several of our team members providing guidance to the person who was seeing the child. So we had sort of a bug in the ear kind of thing going on. And even before the child came in, we all agreed that this was a child that was likely going to have high levels of PTSD. She was in the car at the time, she witnessed the entire event. And when she came into the room, I will tell you that this was the first and only time I can remember where there was not a dry eye behind that mirror, meaning that we were all crying. And the reason was because this child's sadness and sorrow and separation distress was palpable. Um, there was not a trace of PTSD. There was no fear, there was no hypervigilance, there was no being on edge. Um, and in fact, her assessments showed that. So there was no PTSD symptoms to speak of, but intense separation distress. So what the therapist ended up doing with her was finding, helping her to find healthy ways of connecting to her mother through guiding the surviving caregiver, through interactions with the two of them, through finding ways of memor memorializing her mother. Now, if we had used a more trauma-focused approach, where we would have talked about the details of the car accident. Who was there? What does she remember? What did she see? What did she hear? I truly believe that would have caused damage. What she really needed was, based on her assessment, more opportunities to feel connected to her mom. Um, the second one is also interesting. So this was a 12-year-old boy who presents with extremely high levels of PTSD, minimal symptoms of maladaptive grief, during the interview, he states, I just keep remembering it, hearing my parents crying together in their bedroom, and my mom saying, I know the treatment isn't working. I feel like I'm right back there again. I can't get it out of my mind. So obviously, I left out one of the sentences here because it would have given it away. But what we know is that kids who experience the slow, progressive deterioration of a caregiver have lots of traumatogenic elements embedded in those experiences that, as adults, we may not even recognize. So in other words, a parent may believe that a child, you know, has time to say goodbye, that they're prepared, but really what the child is seeing and hearing can be extremely scary. And in fact, we know that cries from caregivers, those in a caregiving role, are some of the strongest and most potent trauma reminders. So it's not surprising that this would be extremely traumatic for this child. And in our society, again, there's this mistaken notion that if the death is anticipated, then it's unlikely to cause post-traumatic stress or be traumatic. But what we find also in our empirical data, and this was a study that was replicated recently, um, we looked at kids who had experienced the death of a parent and found that those who lost a parent by illness, anticipated illness, actually had higher levels of PTSD symptoms and maladaptive grief compared to kids who experienced the death of a parent due to an accident, like a car accident, or a sudden natural death. But, you know, of course, suicide and homicide still produce those very high levels of PTSD as well. But again, this finding that the anticipated deaths tend to elicit more PTSD than these other types of deaths may be counterintuitive. Um, but again, very important to recognize in those kids that are experiencing the impending death of a caregiver. So I want to move now into really distinguishing PTSD from grief and why this is a difference that does make a difference. So PTSD and grief are not the same thing. They have different precipitating factors. And what we mean by that is that when kids are confronted with a trauma reminder, so people, places, or things that remind them of the scary event that happened, that tends to lead to PTSD. But when they're presented with a loss reminder, people, places, or things that remind them that their person is no longer there physically, that tends to segue into grief reactions. And I'll explain in a minute why we think this distinction is so important with regard to trauma and loss reminders. They have different physiological eff effects. And so sometimes when we really try to help people understand this difference between PTSD and grief, if you imagine 
the last time you were so petrified that you didn't know whether to run or freeze in place, that is often what PTSD feels like in the body. But if you think about the last time you were so sad that you didn't know if you could stop crying or even were worried about crying because you weren't sure if you could stop the floodgates and feeling that intense sorrow, that is very different physiologically from trauma. And so imagine those kids, especially in our underserved communities, where they're experiencing trauma and grief at the very same time. That is both physiologically and psychologically incredibly taxing. And so again, this is why we really want to be able to intervene early for those kids that have both traumas and losses. And they require different assessment tools. So the way we go about screening for and assessing PTSD is very different than how we screen and assess grief. And finally, they require different practice elements. So just like we talked about, you know, different dimensions of grief require different practice elements. Similarly, the way we go about treating PTSD is very different than the way we treat grief in children. So I want to just um, get, share with you a couple examples of what we what we think about when we're referring to trauma versus loss reminders. Um, so first, defining this again, trauma reminders are images, sounds, smells, people or situations that remind the child of the traumatic event. This is again what often leads to PTSD. Whereas loss reminders are images, sounds, smells, people or situations that remind the child of the absence of the person who died. And this is often what leads to grief reactions. So I want to share with you um, an interview that we conducted with a 17-year-old who actually witnessed the murder of her mother by her father. Not only did she witness the murder, um, but she tried to intervene. So she was extremely traumatized. And you'll see that this was um, when we were testing out a new semi-structured interview for PTSD. So you'll see that the questions are pretty scripted. But I think this gives a really good example of what we mean by a trauma reminder. The clinician says, do you get very afraid, upset, or sad when something reminds you of what happened? The patient says, oh yeah, screaming, the door slamming, firecrackers, that and seeing or hearing arguments. Whenever I hear somebody fussing or anyone arguing, especially if it's a man, I want to run and just go get a knife. It brings me right back. I get to the point where I'm so scared I'll kill you if you make another move. I wouldn't mean to do it, it's just out of fear. They could even just be playing, but just hearing that scream, it just makes me feel like I'm back there again. And the clinician says, and when these things happen, how much do they bother you? And the patient says, on a scale of one to 10, I'd have to say 20. So if you think about some of the things that she's encountering, probably on a daily basis, like screaming on the playground or doors slamming at school or even at home, hearing arguments, she is probably completely overwhelmed with that onslaught of trauma reminders, which is likely why for her this is up to a 20, that this is just overwhelming. And you can see that these are things that remind her of the incident, especially firecrackers we know is sort of a classic reminder of the sound of a gunshot. Um, and screaming, of course, fussing, arguing, was what directly led to the death of her mother. And then the clinician goes on to ask some questions, and I think this is a really important distinction. She says, and have you tried to stay away from people, places, or things that remind you of what happened? The patient says, I can't go to the mall anymore. I went only one time after she died, but I couldn't go after that. There's a lot of stores and stuff that I like there, and I want to go so bad, but I can't because I don't have my mama anymore. The clinician says, is that because the mall reminds you of what happened, or... She says, the mall just reminds me of her in general. Through good times and bad times, we always went there together. So this is not a trauma reminder, right? This is not reminding her of the incident. This is reminding her, I don't have my mom here with me, and it's too painful to do these things without her. So why is this an important distinction? The reason it's so important is because, number one, when we know what kids' personal trauma and loss reminders look like, we can help predict how they might react in different situations. And this is particularly important in school and classroom environments where kids may be reminded of things without the teachers even recognizing it, like the sound of the school bell ringing or doors slamming, for example. If we are aware of that, we can help to empower teachers and students to either avoid those things or to plan for how they're gonna cope with those things as they encounter them. So 
What I also want to emphasize here is that we do need treatments that distinguish between trauma and grief. So this is one of the examples of the interventions that we've been both using and disseminating to school-based clinicians, um, not only in the greater Houston area, but actually nationally. So trauma and grief component therapy is what's known as a modularized therapy. And it has four different modules. The first module is really focusing on group cohesion, psychoeducation, and basic coping skills. So one thing that I'll mention is that this is an intervention that can be used either individually or in groups. It was used after 9-11, after Columbine, after the Santa Fe school shooting, after Hurricane Harvey. Um, so it's been used in all kinds of traumatic situations, but it's also been used in juvenile justice settings, in places where there are high levels of community violence, where trauma and loss are very prevalent. The second module is focusing on trauma processing. The third is grief processing, so reducing the more maladaptive grief reactions and harnessing those more adaptive grief reactions. And then the fourth module is helping kids to have goals and aspirations for the future and how to get there. For many of the kids that we work with who've experienced you know, trauma after trauma or loss after loss, often they have given up. Often they are very focused on survival. You know, how do I get to the next day, let alone thinking about how do I think about my future and what can I do in my future? So this has been a really important module for those kids that, again, have had those cumulative traumas and losses. And so what do we know about TGCT in terms of its effectiveness? We know that it reduces PTSD, depression, and maladaptive grief reactions, but we also know that it improves school behavior. So these are some of the things that, again, can be um, sort of the consequences of experiencing trauma and grief. Often they tend to have um, you know, school problems, as we mentioned before. But using TGCT, we've found that, that school behavior improves. And these things include enhanced classroom rule compliance, positive peer relationships, enhanced school performance, increased school interest, decreased school anxiety, and importantly, decreased violence. So um, I do want to say, I'm going to go back to this slide for one minute, you know, we um, offer trainings in trauma and grief component therapy through the Trauma and Grief Center. About quarterly, we will provide a free two-day training to school-based clinicians and um, these clinicians become part of what we call our trauma and grief coalition. This is a group of clinicians that um, were growing slowly over time, where we recognize that in different parts of the country, others may not know who is trained in an evidence-based treatment for trauma and grief. And in the event of another hurricane or another tragedy, often they don't know where to turn to. So the Trauma and Grief Coalition that we're building are made up of not just school-based clinicians, but also community-based clinicians who are trained in this modality, who can be called upon if, if again, there is some kind of tragedy in their community. So um, at the very end, I will give you our website. And if you're interested in being part of any of these trainings, you're welcome to reach out. And um, again, we offer these about quarterly. So tips for educators and caregivers. What can educators do to support grieving students? The first is that they can acknowledge the loss. I think that oftentimes what we hear from teachers and, and administrators is, you know, should we just sort of let sleeping dogs lie? Do we bring it up? Do we mention it? And the idea here is that it is so important to talk about it. Um, it's not that we have to obviously make the child feel uncomfortable or, you know, um, sort of highlight the loss, but it is important to acknowledge the loss and to at least privately mention to that child, I am so sorry for your loss. It's also important to empower the student, the, the student himself or herself who's coming back from having experienced a loss. So one of the best ways I saw this um, sort of play out in a classroom is that a child lost his mother, he was going back to school, and we worked with the teacher to kind of figure out what to do. And instead of having each individual child approach this student with a condolence card or words of support, um, the teacher put together a large envelope filled with cards from the students. She handed it to the bereaved student and said, we just want you to know we're thinking about you. You can open this whenever you feel up to it. 
And so it really empowered the student to, on his own terms, be able to look at those things and, and hold on to them, as opposed to feeling, um, you know, like bombarded with a lot of attention. We also want to give students words to express support, just as we as adults struggle to find the right words when we're offering condolences to an adult, children also have trouble. So as teachers and administrators, we can tell them, you know, um, some of the nice things you might be able to say are, I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm here if you want to talk. Um, I, I'm here if you need me. So those are just some examples, but giving kids those words are, is a really important piece of this. And then anticipating loss or trauma reminders. So again, um, is Mother's Day coming up? Is this a student who's really gonna struggle during that time? Can we help to find someone, not to replace mom, but to sort of stand um, in her absence as someone who can support that child? Recognize the adaptive side of grief. So again, we wanna make sure that we're not completely pathologizing any child who loses a loved one, um, but recognizing that there is such thing as good grief and we can help to foster that in students and children. But at the same time, it's important to identify those kids that are at risk and get them the intervention they need. And this is where we wanna help empower teachers and school administrators to make those appropriate mental health referrals. And we're gonna talk more about how to do that. So how do you even know when a referral is necessary? What we often see in terms of red flags are things like significant developmental regressions where kids who used to sleep well or had good eating habits, good hygiene, show um, sort of regressions in those areas. Extreme signs of depression, like constantly tearful, not able to get out of bed, not able to function or make decisions. Behaviors that interfere with functioning in any major life domain in significant ways. Any gesture related to self-harm or mention of suicidal ideation, of course, would require a more thorough assessment. And then signs of possible PTSD. So we would be looking for these things after about a month has passed since the tragedy. But things like re-experiencing, so um, a student feeling like it's happening all over again. Avoidance, not wanting to talk about or think about the person who died. Negative cognitions or mood, so persistent anger or guilt. Arousal and reactivity, exaggerated startle response, so looking and feeling jumpy all the time. And in adolescence, this can also include reckless or self-destructive behavior. So these are all things that, from our perspective, would require a referral and an evaluation from a trained clinician. So what are some things caregivers can do to support grieving youth? We know, first of all, that caregivers are key grief facilitators, meaning that kids often model their grief after what they're seeing in their environment, particularly their surviving caregiver. And so what we also know is that there is such thing as positive parenting, and this has been studied by colleagues like Erwin Sandler, um, where you're really looking at the ability to express affection, keep routines, and provide structure. So those are sort of the key elements of positive parenting as he sees it. And this has been found to be associated with less maladaptive grief reactions and distress in children after the death of a caregiver. But it's also important for caregivers to remember that the key is not what you say, but what you do. And this was a study um, conducted by one of my graduate students several years ago, Danielle Shapiro, where we found that there were some specific behaviors that actually were associated with decreased maladaptive grieving in children. These included simple things like hugs, physical affection, smiling, consistent eye contact, and really just being present. So what she found is that it really wasn't about what the parent was saying to the child. It was much more focused on what was the parent doing? Did they feel like they were present in the room? Were they bearing witness to the child's pain? And were they able to be fully present even in the midst of that grief? And so these are more specific things that caregivers can do to support grieving youth. One is um, you know, to address separation distress. So we know that this is very common in grieving kids. So the idea here is to help kids find healthy ways of connecting with the person who died. This can include things like writing a letter and including writing a response to the letter. So for example, if a child writes a letter to their deceased father, um, having the child then write a response, what would she hope that dad would say back to her? That's actually a really critical part of that exercise. <clears throat> 
identifying mementos that they can hold on to, tangible objects, or talking openly about the person. That's really important. And I chose this illustration because this was a patient that was seen at the Trauma and Grief Center who suddenly lost her father. And you can see here that um, he is depicted playing cards in heaven with his, um, his own father who had passed away. And um, he's in his lounge chair watching TV. And if you look up here, this is what they referred to, the child referred to as the family channel, but it was just her own family. So he was watching live what they were doing. Um, and he was watching from heaven and you can't really see it right here. There's a little sign that says to real life. And what she said is that when um, dad is watching TV and he sees that there's a very special family event, or if the family is distressed in some way, he can just come on down through this gateway and be there in spirit. And so I thought this was just such an amazing example of how children can make sense of this and can find ways of feeling connected, even if it's through a tech savvy way that I myself would not have thought of. To address existential distress. so. These ideas are really related to helping kids identify traits or behaviors that they had in common with the person who died. So how can they carry on their legacy or find ways to honor their memory? Um, so for example, a child said, you know, my dad was so funny, he had the best sense of humor, um, I'm going to try to be funny. Or, you know, even if it's just habits they acquire or positive traits. So this child here is saying they would be so proud. Again, finding ways of living their life that, you know, in their own mind would have made the person proud of them. That's a way of addressing existential distress. And then what can caregivers do to support grieving youth around circumstance-related distress? This one is a little bit tricky because if kids still have questions or concerns about the way the person died, this often requires a difficult conversation about how the person died. Um, kids have trouble making meaning of the death if they still don't really understand how they died. So that's sort of the first piece of this, is really helping kids to understand the circumstances and then brainstorming about how they can transform the circumstances into something meaningful that can help others. This can be raising money for breast cancer. It can be um, you know, becoming an ER doc so that um, they can help people in the way that they wish their own parent had been helped. So um, we've seen this time and time again. Kids will gravitate toward careers that in some way may have changed the circumstances of their own caregiver's death if that person had been there for them. Um, <clears throat> and this is something that the surviving caregiver can, can really help with. So I wanna just touch on, before we end, a really important topic, which is the cumulative impact of traumas and losses on us as caregivers, parents, teachers, those who are caring for children. So what we see here is that, you know, past trauma can um, then start to accumulate with bad news, the pandemic itself, more stress, and then you have a minor incident like stubbing your toe and you're sobbing, right? And we see this happening all the time where the most minor things seem to cause an eruption of emotion. Um, and this is very normal. And what we know is that when that is happening, that means that something's got to give. Um, and we have to be paying more attention to what's going on for ourselves and to be focusing on our own self-care. So self-care is the ability to engage in helping others without sacrificing other important parts of one's life. So it's not as if we're saying other people's problems don't matter, but what we're saying is my um, own, you know, my own life, my own happiness is just as important. I need to be thinking about how I'm going to foster that so that I can still be present and helpful to other people. So we, this is something we often tell both teachers and parents, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first, right? You have to ensure that you're getting the support you need in order to be there for your students, in order to be there for your kids. And I will just mention that there are lots of terms being used for the cost of caring. So vicarious trauma, this is sort of experiencing the trauma that your students are experiencing, vicarious grief, secondary traumatic stress. This is when you actually start to develop symptoms of PTSD because of what you're seeing others experiencing or hearing about. <clears throat> 
compassion fatigue, of course, most people know what that is, where you're just, you know, you can't do it anymore. You're feeling like I just can't go on um, and burn out. But there is good news. The silver lining is that <clears throat> we know that there is something called compassion satisfaction, that we can derive great pleasure from helping others, that you can know in your heart of hearts that what you're doing is actually making a difference for children. We also know there's something called vicarious resilience. This is positive transformation as a result of bearing witness to individuals overcoming adversity. And I would say this has been the one most important thing that I see in the clinicians that work with me is that that's incredibly powerful to see that kids are overcoming tragedies and losses um, in a way that is actually helping them to um, be stronger and to come out on the other side um, in a better place. And that can be incredibly healing for us as clinicians. And then engaging in self-care and self-compassion can help reduce the cost of caring and increase personal resiliency. So this is a talk in and of itself, but just recognizing that the key, again, is self-compassion, um, knowing that you yourself deserve to be happy, to be content, and making sure that there's room in your life to be paying close attention to that so that you, know, so that you are able to be able to help other people um, over time. So I wanna just mention a few resources that we have um, that could be helpful. The first is that our Trauma and Grief Center has what's called a virtual learning library now, where we have webinars, freely downloadable webinars on different topics related to trauma and grief for different audiences, including teachers, caregivers, law enforcement. Um, we, are, we are soon going to have Spanish versions of those trainings as well. And we also have handouts for caregivers focusing on um, different ways that they can support children who are grieving. And I'm gonna to touch on those um, right now. So we have um, a series called The Power of Parenting, where we, what I love about these is that we've had caregivers with lived experience provide quotes and guidance and information to other caregivers who are experiencing the very same thing. And so these handouts really come from a place of knowing what it is like to experience the death of a loved one. So we have those that focus on helping kids cope with the impending death of a loved one, um, how to cope um, in the event of um, substance use overdose, or we also have one focusing on suicide. So how do we help kids overcome these, these very tragic circumstances? And then finally, I'll mention that, um, as Stephen mentioned earlier, we have the Lucene Center for Trauma and Grief. Um, we are housed here in Houston, but we see kids across the state of Texas and throughout Louisiana through teletherapy. So we only provide teletherapy. We don't see kids in person, um, but we will see kids ages eight and up who have experienced a trauma or a loss. And again, um, the services are free of charge. So if anyone is interested, that is the website. And here's just some more information. If you want to reach out to me, I would love to hear from you. Um, that's my email. I also listed the websites there. And then if for, all, for any of you who are interested in some of the papers that I mentioned today, if you just go to, if you just Google Julie Kaplow Academia, you can download all of those papers um, free of charge from that, from that particular website. Okay, so I am going to stop sharing my screen, and I think we have at least a few minutes to answer any questions that people have. So we do have one question that I think you you really answered uh, already, but can teachers, Dana Moody asks, can teachers be trained? Is there a specific training for teachers? Yes, so we actually do have um, a series of trainings that we've been doing for teachers focusing on how to identify trauma in students, how to identify grief in students, how to provide sort of a, a trauma and grief informed school environment, and then also how to know when to make a referral and, and what it looks like to make a, an appropriate referral. So the answer is yes. Um, and for, you know, in order to receive that training, all they would need to do is, is reach out to me through email. And did, did you share your email with everyone? I did a minute ago, but I'm happy to, um, you want me to put it in the Q and A? Yeah. Why don't we put it? Well, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, yeah. So is there a training program for students who are planning to work in trauma? 
Um, so we do take some students. So we have just started to take some practicum students through the Lucene Center. Um, so if any intern, a psychology intern or a social work grad student is interested, again, they, they can reach out to me. Um, and I don't know if it showed up in the Q&A, Stephen, so... Um, no, can you put up the, the last slide with all the links? Can you share sure. your screen? Yeah. Oops. There we go. So the email is jcaplow at mmhpi.org. Okay, and uh, we don't need to see my face, so let's just leave that up there. Is it possible to heal childhood traumas as an adult? Is that yes. doable? The, the short answer is yes. <laughs> Um, but that would, uh, you know, most of the time, if it's, you know, a significant childhood trauma that's still causing symptoms of PTSD or distress, um, then it often does require therapy. But absolutely, adults can overcome childhood traumas. What is the specific age that child, in, in, what is the specific age that child encompasses? Like zero to eight, oh yeah. So when you're referring to ch children, what's the age group that you're referring to? So when I'm referring to children that we serve, um, we, we serve kids ages eight and up through the Lucene Center. Um, when I'm referring to children in the studies that I mentioned, typically they have been ages seven and up. Um, there have been, you know, some studies certainly of children younger than that, but um, most of our research has focused on kids ages seven and up because um, the interventions that we've developed have been designed for that age group. And can it be applied to young adults? Yes, absolutely. So trauma and grief component therapy actually has been used with um, adults up to age 25. So, so yes. Okay. And Barbara Tarver Thomas, if you're still on, I, I don't know, the, there's a, you have a question here, requirements to become a volunteer for the center? I guess, are there requirements to become a volunteer for your center? Um, that's a really good question. Um, no, not necessarily. Uh, you know, we have some opportunities for volunteering. Um, although they're a little bit limited because obviously we're dealing with, you know, patient care. And so we have to be a little bit careful. Um, but, but again, they're welcome to reach out to me and, and we can talk about what opportunities are available. And um, uh, Mara Garza asked, will, be, will we be able to have the PowerPoint presentation? Well, I can tell you that this uh, presentation is being recorded and in about 10 days, it'll be available on the, um, on the College of Public Services YouTube channel. So um, the PowerPoint presentation will be in the, you know, is recorded as it was here tonight. So it'll be in the presentation. Does anyone have any other questions for Dr. Kaplow? All right. Well, Dr. Kaplow, thank you so very much. Dr. Kaplow is coming back in April to give a, a sort of modified version of this presentation, more specifically geared to practitioners, social workers, and uh, criminal justice professionals. As you would imagine, the different types of trauma, you know, as she was alluding to tonight, it's very, the trauma and grief is very specific to circumstances. And so she'll be giving that, uh, that, that presentation in April. Um, so we're getting people, Diana and Alexis are, thanking, are saying thank you for your time and the useful information. Thank you all for attending the presentation tonight. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Capolo. Thank you, everyone.